Hey guys, this is Brother Ray Jones with the First Church of God in Princeton, West Virginia. I want to welcome you to our midweek Bible study. I hope you're having a great week. And I thank you for tuning in tonight to be a part of this virtual time of learning and growing together. As people are logging in, uh, we would appreciate it if you'd let us know that you are uh, here and participating. Please uh, put a comment, tell us good evening, or uh, use one of those emoji buttons to hit whatever you may like. And uh, we just appreciate your participation in this service tonight. If you have any comments, you feel free to type those in. Uh, we would love to interact with you in this time of learning and growing together. We're going to begin a new series tonight. This is the first of three lessons on the life of Samson. And we're going to be looking in Judges chapter 13. And tonight, a whole lot of what we're going to talk about this evening is just a lot of background and the birth of Samson. So uh, we're looking forward to seeing what we can learn about his life. And we're going to start there this evening. Before we get into Judges 13, we do want to take a moment to pray together. I want to share some prayer requests with you that are current to the time of the sharing of this lesson. We want to remember the family of Keith Mullins. He passed away, and as uh, that family mourns that loss, we want to be praying for them. We want to remember the Shoup family. Uh, Bobby and Cherish had their little baby. Little Stella was born uh, recently. She came a few weeks prematurely, actually uh, several weeks prematurely, but she's doing really, really good. She was five pounds, uh, 16 inches long, and she is at uh, the uh, Charleston Hospital in the NICU and getting the great attention that she needs, the great medical care that she needs. We want to continue to pray that she just develops as she needs to and do very much be in prayer for um, Bobby and for Cherish. Congratulations to them especially, but we do be praying for them. We want to continue to pray for B. Shoemate. Uh, she uh, is recovering from a stroke and very much needs our prayers. A pastor friend of mine, Tom Franks, needs our prayers. He had a very successful surgery that had to do with uh, cancer that he is battling, and we just want to pray that he recovers well from that. Uh, we also tonight want to be remembering the uh, our Mr. Jeff Sicilian. He's been diagnosed with mouth cancer, and we want to pray for him. We got word as well that Susie Flint, uh, she's been on our prayer list for some time, and she passed away. We want to remember that family as we are praying together tonight. Maybe you have a request, and we would love for you to make us aware of that. Please feel free to put that in the comments or to send us a direct message so that we can be agreeing with you in prayer about those needs. But let's take some time and pray together this evening. Lord, thank you so very much for the opportunity to be able to gather up and to study your word together this evening. Uh, we ask, Lord, that you would bless in this time as we look into your word and help us, Lord, to just take in what you want us to learn and that we might be able to be better people for you. We do ask tonight that you would be with uh, the various requests, especially for these families who lost loved ones. We pray, Lord, for the family of Susie Flint. We ask, Father, that you would comfort them like only you can. We pray, Lord, that you'd be with the Mullins family. Lord, with this unexpected loss, we just pray that you would comfort them and see them through this time as well. We thank you, Lord, uh, for having your hand on little Stella. Uh, we pray, Father, that you would continue to touch her and that she would indeed develop as she needs to and that you would bless her with great help. We pray, Father, for Bobby and for Cherish and ask, Lord, that you would just help them as they uh, take care of their little baby girl. We pray, Father, that you would be with B tonight. We lift her before you and pray that you would touch and have mercy and bring healing to her body. And Father, uh, we pray for Mr. Sicilian. We ask that you would touch his body and bring healing from this cancer. Lord, I pray for uh, Pastor Tom Franks and just ask that you would continue to help him to recover, to have a full and a speedy recovery from this surgery. And Lord, we pray, Father, that they, would, they have indeed gotten all of this cancer and he would have no further problems with that. Father, for the other needs and requests that are represented in, on this prayer list, and for those that are being messaged in, we lift them before you and we entrust them to your care. Again, Lord, we ask that you would help us tonight as we learn from your word. Lord, help us to, to grow and to be more like you. We love you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen 
and amen. Thank you for taking time to agree together in prayer. If you have your Bibles, I want you to look with me in Judges, the 13th chapter. We're going to look, again, this is the first of a three-part series talking about the life of Samson. Now, uh, many of you probably remember the character, the Bible character, Samson, and he uh, was used mightily of the Lord. He was a very strong man. But um, there's some things about his life that we want to look into a little deeper. And we're going to begin this evening in Judges chapter 13. And again, a whole lot of what we're going to cover tonight is just some background information up to his birth. So the first thing I want us to bear in mind is that Samson was born at a time when God's people were rebelling against him. In Judges chapter 13, the first verse, we read these words. Again, the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord delivered them into the hand of the Philistines for 40 years. Um, we need to take note of that. History has taught us over and over and over again. When God's people honor him and bless his name, uh, God blesses them in return, and there are prosperous times that occur. But a lot of times when you read through the Old Testament, you'll find out that God's people would um, fear him and honor him and, and he would bless them. And then they would things would get good, basically, or things would be going well and they would stray from God. And people did what was right in their own eyes. And when that happened and when they did evil in the sight of the Lord, as Judges 13, 1 talks about, God withdrew his hand of blessing and hard times came. That was the situation that Samson was born into. The people of God had done evil in the sight of the Lord. They had denied the Lord. They had turned their backs on him and on his teaching. And now judgment was coming in the form of their enemies oppressing them. Um, I would like to think that we've learned from history and that we don't have a problem in our current time of, as the people of God, that we just fear the Lord and honor him and do right in his sight, and he's just going to continue to bless us. But the reality of it is, that's not what people have done or are doing. Many times, unfortunately, we stray. And when we as a nation stray, or even we as individuals stray, we're opening ourselves up to God withdrawing his hand of blessing on our lives. And when that happens, we are left open to a lot of things that can come in. Uh, judgment can come. And uh, I, I shudder to think how God's judgment has come in modern times. And I pray that it, it, it doesn't have to come on us now. I pray that more and more of us will do what is right in the eyes of the Lord. So Samson comes on the scene at a time when God's people are disobeying him and they're paying the price for it. Please keep this in mind. Whenever we disobey God, there's a price to be paid for that. Now, I want us to understand too that Samson was born to God-fearing parents. Uh, even though the majority of the people of God uh, in the Old Testament weren't obeying the Lord, there was always a remnant, there are always some who were doing right uh, and, and doing their best to follow the Lord and walk in obedience to him. Samson's parents were that kind of people. We read about them picking it up in Judges, the 13th chapter, beginning at verse 2. Let me read that for us. Now, there was a certain man from Zorah of the family of the Danites whose name was Manoah, and his wife was barren and had no children. The angel of the Lord appeared to the woman and said to her, Indeed, now you are barren and have borne no children, but you shall conceive and bear a son. Now, therefore, please be careful not to drink wine or similar drink, nor to eat anything unclean. For behold, you shall conceive and bear a son, and no razor shall come upon his head, for the child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb. And he shall begin to deliver Israel out of the hand of the Philistines. So look what's going on here. God's people are coming under judgment. They're under um, rule of their enemy, the Philistines, 
because they've lived in disobedience to God. But God is now choosing to deliver his people and he's going to work through some of his children to make this happen. And he picks out this couple. Uh, we know the husband's name to be Manoah. We do not know the wife's name. Uh, her name is given nowhere in the scripture. So we're going to simply refer to her as Mrs. Manoah. Okay, please don't be offended um, by that. I, I do not know the name to call her. So allow me the opportunity to just give her the title of, or the name of Mrs. Manoah. So we understand as we read through this portion of scripture that the angel of the Lord came to Manoah's wife first. That is interesting to note. God speaks to both men and women. Now, I know that there are some people that may think differently about that, but I want you to understand God speaks to women as well as men, and God spoke to Manoah's wife first. He, uh, he appeared to, he sent the angel of the Lord to appear to her and to give her some amazing and great news. So um, sometimes there are people out there who think that the Bible puts women down. That is far from the truth. The Bible uplifts women and their role before the Lord. And there's plenty of examples in both the Old and the New Testament of how God moved mightily in and through women as well as men. And in this case, um, he come, the angel of the Lord comes to Mrs. Manoah first. Now, we also know from this particular portion of Scripture that Mrs. Manoah was barren. She was unable to have a child. Uh, Manoah and his wife were childless up to this point in their lives. And the message that God was giving through the angel to Mrs. Manoah is that, hey, you're, you're going to have a baby. Now, uh, God had intervened several times throughout the Bible in couples who were barren. Uh, one classic example of that is with Sarah in the Old Testament. That was Abraham's wife, and uh, she was barren, and God intervened and they had Isaac. Then later on, that baby they had grew up and got married and one of his wives, Rebecca, was barren and God intervened and had mercy on her and supernaturally worked and they were able to have a baby. Then later on, Jacob's wife, Rachel, was barren. We read about that in the Bible and, and God saw fit at just the right time to work a miracle there and see to it that they had a baby. We read of uh, Samson's parents, Elkanah and Hannah. Hannah was barren, but she sought the Lord and God blessed her and gave her and Elkanah a baby boy named Samson. You come into the New Testament, you read about a couple named Zacharias and Elizabeth. They were way up in years and they had prayed for a long time that God would bless them with a child and for whatever reason God did not do that until just the right time and then God heard their prayer actually he'd heard their prayer a long time ago but he chose to give the answer when they were in their um, golden years if you will um, and Zacharias and Elizabeth had a baby boy and that baby boy ended up being named John and we know him as John the baptizer, okay? Um, so th this was nothing new. Um, Manoah and his wife wanted to have a baby, but they did not have one. But God intervened and worked a miracle and blessed them and was going to bless them with a child. Uh, so just let me say to you, if, if you are in the situation where uh, you and your husband very much want to have a child, uh, don't give up on praying to the Lord and seeking his face and asking him to bless you. He's done that before, and I uh, know of modern-day instances where he's done that again as well. Uh, so Manoah and his wife are barren, and God's going to intervene and bless them in a great way. But the angel of the Lord made some very clear instructions here that Mrs. Manoah 
was going to have to make an extra commitment for the sake of her son. He was very clear that, uh, hey, you're going to have a baby, and, and God's going to do great things through the baby that, that is to be born to you, but there's a commitment that you've got to make. This baby would have to be a Nazarite from birth. And in order for the Nazarite vow to be honored, not only would um, the baby that we know is eventually going to be Samson, Samson would have to honor these things, but even while he was in the womb, his mom had to make this commitment as well. And she was told to abstain from alcohol and unclean food. That was part of the Nazarite vow. Now, if you want to understand more fully what the Nazarite vow is, you can go back and read in Numbers chapter 6. Let me give us a quick overview of it. This came from the word Nazir, which means to separate. Um, someone who took the Nazarite vow was separating themselves in a special way unto God. Both men and women could make this vow, according to Numbers chapter 6. It was for a specific amount of time. Usually it was for one year, but some made this commitment for their entire lifetime. In the Bible, we know that Sam, Samson, as we're reading about now, Samuel, and John the Baptist each made this vow. And you can study that for yourself and find out more about those people who made that vow and what, um, what that meant. But he, here are some of the specific things that was included in the vow. Uh, they were to drink no wine or intoxicating drink. That was just part of the commitment they had made. And to be quite honest with you, I think that's a real good idea just for all of us to make. But the Nazarites, they had that vow specifically in their commitment. They also were to, to uh, have nothing from the vine at all. They couldn't even eat grapes or raisins or anything that grew on the vine. That was part of the commitment. For the amount of time that they, were, they had made this vow, they were to not cut their hair. For whatever reasons, that was part of the Nazarite vow. And one other thing, they were to have no contact with a dead body. Uh, that was a part of the commitment under the Nazarite vow. So anyone who made the vow to be a Nazarite would be refraining or abstaining from wine and intoxicating drink they would have nothing from the vine at all, no grapes, no raisins, none of that. They wouldn't cut their hair, and they had no con they were committing to make no contact with a dead body. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, now, here's something interesting that we need to know. Um, sometimes God calls individuals to a commitment that others are not required to make. Okay? There are some things that, that God wants us all to do. He wants us all to love one another. He wants us all to not steal and not lie and not cheat and that kind of thing. But there are some sacrifices that certain ones are called to make in obedience to him because that's the path that he has for them that others may not be required to make. The Nazarite vow is an example of that. Not everyone was compelled to make this particular Nazarite vow. Uh, Samson and his mom actually were going to have to make that vow. But there's some other biblical examples of that. Um, if you go in the New Testament, you will read of how Jesus uh, healed a demoniac. And uh, when he healed that man that was just full of demons that hung out in the cemetery and cut himself and he was all chained up and that kind of thing, when, he, when that man was set free and the people in the town came out and looked at him and thought, what in the world is going on here? Jesus divinely worked in that man's life and set him free from demon possession and put him on the right path. That man, that demoniac, as he's referred to, he begged Jesus, let me go with you and travel with you and do ministry with you. And Jesus looked at him and said, nope, you need to stay right here. And you need to minister to the people in your hometown. Uh, Jesus thought in this case, this man who was the equivalent of the town drunk, if you will, on steroids, if you will, he would be used of the Lord best to live his new life 
right there in the land of the Gadarenes and show day in and day out to all the community the glory of God in his changed life. Now, you read it a different part in the New Testament. You found out about a guy who was a rich young ruler. He was an upstanding part of his community. He had all kinds of money, all kinds of influence. He was a very moral person. But this young man comes to Jesus and he says, hey, what have I got to do to have eternal life? And Jesus says, well, you know, you know the law. Uh, honor your parents. Don't steal. Don't kill. Don't cheat. That kind of thing. Don't commit adultery. And, and this uh, rich young ruler says, hey, I'm good then. I've done all of this from the time that I was in, in youth group. And Jesus said, you know what? You got, you got one other thing you need to do, though. You need to go and sell everything that you have, give the money to the poor, and then you need to come with me and travel around and, and, and be a part of my traveling ministry. And that, if you read through that story in Mark 10, I believe it is, you'll find out that that man was not willing to make that sacrifice. Now, uh, why would Jesus tell the, the man that was full of demons to stay right there in his town? And why would he ask the rich young ruler to come and follow him? Well, does that mean that everybody's got to stay at home and just be a witness in their hometown? Or does that mean that, <coughs> excuse me, everybody's got to sell everything that they've got and, and, and travel around and do ministry? But no, it, it could be either or. It depends on God's specific call on your life. Does, I hope that makes sense to you, and, and I hope you'll take heart in that. Don't look at what sacrifice somebody else has had to make necessarily. Be sure you know the sacrifice that God wants you to make, and then make it for the glory of God. And if that means that you're supposed to go away and serve, go away and serve. If it means you're supposed to stay right there in your hometown and serve, stay right there and serve. Whatever can give God the greatest glory, he will make that known to you. Then it's up to us to honor that commitment. Samson and his mom were going to have to make a very big commitment in this Nazarite vow. Okay? Now, um, after the angel of the Lord had spoken to Mrs. Manoa, she goes to tell her husband what happened. And you can read through Judges 13, verses 6 through 10, and you find out how he, uh, how uh, Mrs. Manoah recounts to her husband, hey, here's what happened. You will not believe it. This angel showed up, and he says, we're going to have a baby, and I'm going to have to uh, make uh, certain commitments. And, man, this is exciting. And Manoah says, all right, hey, this is great, but please let this guy show up again. I... I really want to hear this for myself. Now, Manoah wasn't being mean by saying this. He just wanted to be on the same page with his wife. Okay, He wasn't discounting what she had said. He believed her. He just wanted to be sure that they could be together on this. Now, we know from when we read through this part of the Bible that Manoah also had a commitment to God. Okay? Not only was his wife a Christ follower or a God follower in this case, um, but he was as well. That is vitally important. As a matter of fact, uh, in this part of what we want to understand about Samson, Samson in large part became the person that he ended up becoming because God saw fit uh, for him to come into a godly home. Uh, I do not want to understate this. The best thing, mom and dad, that you can do for your children is to have a God-honoring relationship and raise them in a God-honoring home. That is what Manoah and his wife did. They both knew and feared the Lord and served the Lord, and, and they wanted to honor God more than anything. And not only that, I see in this, they had a good marriage. They communicated with one another. When Mrs. Manoa had heard from an angel of the Lord, she wanted to go and talk to her husband about it. And her, her husband heard what she had to say, and he had some questions. They were legitimate questions. And they worked together. They communicated well, and they worked together towards what God had for them to do. Please note, communication is key in marriage. And you got to work at communicating well. you got to work at, at communicating and saying what uh, you want to say to your spouse or to another party, 
and then you got to be actively careful to hear what the other person's saying. Communication is a challenge, isn't it? Um, I heard a story one time of a, uh, a man and his wife, and the wife was getting up in age, getting in the middle age years, and she was kind of lamenting her birthday was the next day, and she just kind of said in passing, oh, what I really want for my birthday is to be six again. And her husband heard that. And being a loving husband, hearing what her desire was, he, he got up the next day on her birthday and encouraged her to get up early. And they started out after going and getting donuts and milk. They went to all the parks and to amusement rides and just was having the time of their lives, or so he thought. And when lunchtime came, he took her to McDonald's and got her a Happy Meal and a milkshake. And then after lunch, they went to a matinee showing of the latest Disney movie. And boy, they were just having a big old time. And they just went all over. And by the end of the day, they were both exhausted. And um, the husband <laughs> looks at his wife and says, so what did you think? Did you feel like you were six again? And she looks back at him and says, Honey, what I meant was I, what I wanted my dress size to be. <laughs> Communication is hard. She didn't want to really be six years old. She wanted to be a size six, okay? So communication can be difficult. But particularly in marriage, if you're going to have a good marriage, like Manoa and his wife did, you've got to work together and you've got to communicate, okay? So... Um, Mrs. Manoah has been told by the angel of the Lord that you're going to have a baby and he's going to be a very special baby. He's got a purpose before God. He's going to set God's people free. He's going to deliver them from this oppression of the Philistines. And Manoah hears about this. He says, okay, I want to be on the same page with you. I sure hope this guy shows back up and talks to both of us. Well, if you read in Judges 13, verses 11 through 23, you'll find out that is exactly what happened. The angel of the Lord shows back up to Mrs. Manoah. And uh, when she hears from the angel again, she looks at him and says, wait right here. And she runs and she gets Manoah. And they sit down and have this following conversation. Um, Manoah asked him, are you the man who spoke to this woman, to my wife? And he said, I am. Manoah said, now let your words come to pass. What will be the boy's rule of life and his work? So the angel then goes on to explain to Manoah, just like he did to his wife, hey, he's to keep the Nazarite vow. He's to abstain from these certain things. And your wife needs to abstain from these things as well. And when you bring him into this world, you make sure that you raise him in this way and you watch and see how God's going to use him in a mighty way. Well, you read down through here, and Manoah's like, wow, this is great. Uh, can, we, can we do something for you? Can we feed you a meal? The angel says, you know, you, you need to really understand what's going on here. And the goat, the, the young kid goat that they were going to use to, to feed him, they end up making a sacrifice. And uh, this angel just ascends up into, he into heaven from the fire of that sacrifice. And Manoah gets scared because he suddenly realizes, wow, we were in the presence of the angel of the Lord. And when he, when the full weight of this spiritual experience takes place, uh, when, that, when that comes and rests on Manoah, he, is, he gets very afraid and he thinks, we're going to die because we've seen God himself here. And his wife has to look at him and says, hey, Manoah, well, hold on. If he would have wanted to take our lives, he could have done it while he was here. 
And why would he have told us all of these things that's going to pass if he was going to take us out of here? So in this case, here's another beautiful picture of how a great marriage is to work. Manoah was about to lose his mind, if you will. He was just so scared. And God used his wife to kind of help him see, hey, this is of the Lord. This is not something horrible. Nothing bad's going to happen. God's with us. My friends, as we consider this introduction to the life of Samson, uh, the most important thing that we know at this point about him that can lay the foundation for his life and can lay the foundation for anyone to have a great life is that he had God-honoring and God-fearing parents. Um, and in the conclusion of this chapter, in verses 24 and 25, we find these words. So the woman bore a son and called his name Samson. The child grew and the Lord blessed him. And the Spirit of the Lord began to move upon him at Mahana Dan between Zorah and Eshtael. So here we have it to this point in Samson's life. He's been born and God is beginning to use him greatly. And what we know contributed to, the, uh, to Samson's life up to this point is that his dad, Manoah, and his mom, Mrs. Manoah, were both God-fearing people. So tonight as we conclude this study on uh, this part of Samson's life, let us take away this one important thing. Um, more than anything else, moms and dads, fall on your face before the Lord. Uh, make sure your life is right with Him. And in your life being right with Him, you do your best to follow Him day in and day out. And you raise your kids uh, to the best of your ability with God helping you to know and to serve the Lord. That's going to put them way further down the road in, in, being, in having a great life. Um, my, brother, my brother and I often talk about how blessed we were to be raised by the parents we were raised by. Tom and Janet Jones did a, an amazing job of just being great parents and God-fearing parents, and I'm grateful for that. So tonight, as we again conclude this part of Samson's life, we know beyond a shadow of any doubt that God had a purpose for him, and part of that purpose included uh, using his mom and dad to train him in the ways of God. May we learn from that and pass that on. If uh, you have children at home, do your best to raise them in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. If you're a grandparent, I'm one of those now. Do everything you can as a grandparent when you can to pour into your grandkids' lives. Uh, that will help them more than any other thing. Thank you for your time tonight. I hope you've received a blessing from this. We will pick it up next week with the next lesson as we look uh, into the life of Samson and uh, see what we can learn as we go into those parts. Thank you. God bless you and have a great evening.